My intention every day is to live into my purpose as the unique creation I believe I was put on earth to be in harmony and balance in every area of my life. And my specific intention today is to share some things to help others do the same. Hey, it's Bobby. Welcome to Student of Intention, where we help you enjoy the pursuit of purpose. And remember, don't wait, start small, learn as you go. Hey there, friends. It's Bobby here. I'm really excited for today's show. The drive-in here was just was just glorious. I'll get to that in a second. In the meantime, welcome to Student of Intention. As you know, this is the little space of the podcasting world where we spark, strengthen, and support self-discovery. It is just a wonderful morning here in the Creative Palace. <clears throat> And part of that um, that wonderfulness stems from just my drive over here. I was actually planning on starting the show with a different story, but had this little realization as I was driving my 12-minute drive to, uh, to Irvine in that, uh, as is customary, I start to sort of think about how the show is going to play out, think about my guest, David, and, you know, what, what kind of conversation we're going to have, and... My, my sort of thinking got interrupted by um, a song I hadn't listened to in a while, and I just felt compelled to turn it up. So I turned up the volume, rolled down the window, and just the beautiful morning Southern California sh- uh, sun was shining through the windows, and I'm in my new Cherokee, which I just absolutely love, and I just, I just sort of get taken over by the moment, and I'm really savoring this drive. You know, my, my thoughts were just kind of pushed to the side um, to, to allow this this moment of of just joy and gratitude and really having, I was really just squeezing the juice out of this drive that, you know, I've driven many a times and I could just blitz through and again, could sort of be lost in thought, but instead I chose to savor it. And my guest, David, he and I had actually connected on LinkedIn this morning about that word savor. And I think that's why it popped into my head to share it here is, is we don't savor things enough. And I think, you know, savoring is, is a key to productivity. We're always constantly in search of like productivity, of success, of like getting more out of life. And I actually think those things are sort of a byproduct of having those moments where we're just really connected to the moment. Something is seemingly mundane as a drive into work if we can actually practice being there, you know, listening to the music, feeling the leather of the car, right? Like feeling the breeze of the window, you know, roll down, whatever it is, right? Um, and and, and where there's no shortage of these moments to practice, right? I had my cup of coffee this morning and I can just choose to gulp it down or I can, you know, have, have three or four minutes of just slurping it a little bit, rolling it around the mouth, taking time to enjoy it. You know, things like when we read a book, right? We read a book. Do we read a book to blitz through it and get done with it? Or do we read a book because we really want to get something out of it? We want to, you know, download some extra uh, information that we can kind of approach our, take into our life to approach things differently. I know I've read a book with both of those intentions and I think the, uh, the latter is the more fulfilling approach. So take that for what it's worth today. Just realize that any given moment you're, you're choosing these experiences. You're choosing how, you know, how you want to spend your time and you can spend it sort of lost in thought doing a lot of things, or you can spend it savoring that moment. And I actually would argue the more we can do that, the more productive we become, the more successful we become, um, and all the other things that we choose to do. And with that, like I said, the man who knows plenty about savoring, plenty about purpose, plenty about enjoying coffee, which we may get to, uh, his name is David um, Marlowe. David is a founder of Vluru LLC, where he helps transform businesses and the people that lead them. He's a coach, a consultant, mentor, writer, runner, grandpa, like I said, coffee lover. He's also a U.S. Marine. To some, he's simply just known as the Ica guy guy. I'm a fan of his thoughts and the way he shares them with the world. Um, We connect often and early on LinkedIn. 
and I'm excited to welcome him to Student of Intention. David, welcome. Ah, so glad to be here. Thrilled to be really. It's uh, it's going to be an awesome conversation and uh, wonderful to to meet you in person, right? Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Finally, uh, finally getting connected face to face, and um, like I said, um, when we were getting connected, you're. Uh, you're just energy. I, it, it it hasn't disappointed, and I'm really excited for this conversation. Exchanging words online like we do, like there's there's definitely a synergy, and I'm really really stoked to to kick this thing off. Um, I want to start with, um, just just you just recently said you went to a family wedding, and I just wanted to know how that went. Yeah, we. Uh... We went to, out of state even to uh, to a family wedding. It was the first time uh, my wife and I think have done anything like that forever, right? With the pandemic, and uh, I was it was wonderful. My um, my younger brother, who was the father of the bride, who um, and also officiated the the wedding. He um, uh, several years ago uh, had a sudden illness, and uh, I mean, just like overnight, um, had to have a liver transplant. And he was he was near death uh, when a liver finally became available. And this is actually was the first time that uh, and he's my baby brother. Uh, grew up, shared a room till till literally till I got married. I mean, mm. I shared a room together. Um, and uh, first time I've seen him and and touched him and and was able to to hug him in several years between the uh, the separation you have to have for a transplant and then the pandemic and everything. It. Uh, so it was, it was quite a moment, yeah, it, mm. uh, and just a wonderful weekend of celebration. And uh, my niece is just a s- sweetheart of a girl, and I was happy for her and her husband, and uh, and family and friends. And so, and back to uh, back to my old state, Indiana, is where I'm originally from. So it was uh, it was fun all around. Mm. Sounds like you really savored that one. I did. You know, it, I, I love that you brought that up at the beginning because that is such an important word and action i mean to to embrace the world and i literally went with intention uh into that weekend with the idea of just savoring it soaking up every moment and uh appreciating it in a way that i don't know that i may have done before but with just the last couple of years right it's just focuses it focuses us i can't say that but anyway you know what i mean mm-hmm. uh in on uh, those really important things. And so, uh, and, you know, travel can be, we, we had to drive a number of hours and uh, travel can be tough and things like that. And I just, again, purposed in my mind not to let any of that uh, detour from my enjoyment of the weekend. And it was just a fabulous, fabulous weekend, beautiful weather too and everything. So, yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, from just, uh, just from even seeing you announce it online that, you know, you, you clearly created this space to even, to even have an opportunity to savor it by saying, Hey, like I'm going to announcing it to your audience. I'm going to go do this and then letting it happen. And then you even sort of, um, re-announced your, your, your coming back from it, right? Like just giving the space to enjoy it, I think is really important. And then, you know, when we talk about savor, like what what does that look like? Like I think for me, I, it, it, how I want to help people think of this concept is I think of first and foremost joy, like and in, in, in it's it's somewhat counterintuitive to think of joy as like an action, right? Like I think some of us think of like joy just kind of overcomes us or happiness overcomes us, but I I actually argue it's something you can seek. It's something that you can like sort of dig through whatever the moment is to to find um is that how you saw it in this weekend as well and particularly with something like like you said tra- travel can always be one of those things that i think we can all say like it's okay to to dislike travel but to actually seek joy in travel um i think that's uh th- that's a whole nother bag yeah i like i like that connection to joy and i think joy is that you know people talk about happiness but joy is that deeper element right that's that really really deep feeling that um i think comes from from a level of of intention and being present and you have to start with with a level of pre- presence to savor it so your coffee example is great i mean we all of us have had mornings where you know it was slurp it down and get out the door um but that other uh, my wife was a barista for starbucks and she taught me how to um how they taste coffee and you have to like slurp it and let it 
hit all your tongue because various parts of your tongue have different taste elements or uh, may not be using the right word, but you know what I mean. And notes, uh, <laughs> yeah, nodes <laughs> to get the full, the full flavor and all the, all of the characteristics of that coffee, you, you have to let it hit your entire tongue. And that takes a moment and that takes an intention and being aware then of those, those different flavors and, and aspects of the coffee. And to do that, you can't be thinking about your next meeting, answering emails, your drive in, right? You've got to really be committed to being present in that moment. And to me, that's a that's a huge element of, of savoring anything. Food would be the same kind of thing. Those are those are easy things for us to latch on to, but the moments too, just, you know, again, uh, uh, we've been very lucky, as I said, with my brother uh, and he's, he's quite healthy now and that mm-hmm. could change at any moment. And so I want those interactions with him to matter and, and I want to savor every second I have with him and every encounter I have with him, uh, because I don't know how many I might have, uh, but even if I have a million, I want everyone to be like that. Um, so it's part of it is, is presence, certainly. Yeah, no, and it's, I mean, it's a beautiful example with your brother and I wish you guys a, a long, um, you know, healthy relationship that produces, you know, tons of, tons of beautiful moments. Um, but that's like a perfect example of sort of a high stakes situation where it's like, of course you want to be present there, but I would, you know, I would be, I would argue that like in order to <clears throat> be prepared to be present in those situations, to really savor those situations, let's use the mundane ones, right? The seemingly mundane ones. Let's use the coffee we drink every morning. Let's food the, let's use the food or the meals that we sit down to every day to sort of prepare us for those moments, like weddings, right? Like times where um, um, you're going on vacations, you're, you're putting a lot into um, to whatever you know, moment that is, a new job, uh, a new location, et cetera. Yeah, I, you know, I love that, that, that the idea that, yeah, those big ones are maybe in, in one way they're easy. And yet, if we're not practiced in that, we're not ready for those. I love that idea of using the coffee and the morning drive and whatever other things you have. Um, even reading the paper, I still read a physical paper, so love it. <laughs> I, I like that. I like the. I have the digital subscription too because there's aspects that I like. But I love just holding a paper and actually just reading it, mm-hmm. not scanning it, but like starting at one page and reading to the other. And that's another moment of that savoring and to to incorporate those say, let's say low stakes, low risk uh, events in your life, you're building that muscle, you're building that habit. I mean, that's why I mentioned in my intention that uh, I want to live out that that purpose in every aspect of my life. So in harmony and balance in all aspects of my life. So incorporating them into the mundane and the serious and the work and your family and your personal time and so forth. Um, that's the That's the key element of, of having it in harmony and balance in all aspects of life. Mm. Yeah. And I feel you on the, I'm trying to switch as much of my life to analog as I can. <laughs> <laughs> so reading a real paper, you know, reading a real book. Um, I, I write a newsletter. I write a lot on, on LinkedIn and I do my best to write on, I got notebooks all over the place um, to just write um, as much analog as I can and then eventually transfer it to the digital world. Um, cause I agree there's something, there's something more appreciable, <laughs> um, of, of, of a physical apparatus, right? Something where we're connected to that, to that work physically. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, uh, when I teach in my continuous improvement work to, to write things down, to use, use post-its and whiteboards <laughs> because the, the mechanism of writing is different. I mean, if I, if I write an A, that's a different process in my brain. It's a different aspect of the thinking than if I type an A on a keyboard because typing an A on a keyboard or typing a B or typing a C or any other letter is just that same motion. Whereas writing, it requires a different level of thought in your brain it draws on different aspects of your memory and, and stores things differently. And so having that tactile uh, feel as well as the visual that you create, like, uh, again, I, I recommend post-it notes for you know any kind of innovation work or anything like that, um, because it is, it's, it's very different in how you respond to it and what it does to facilitate your thinking. 
Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, all of it, right? All of these, these actions that we choose to take, all of these ways that we choose to experience life, they, um, you know, they create our, uh, I think they lead up to our purpose or how we experience the world and how we pursue that purpose, um, which I know you do a ton of work with both businesses, coaches, et cetera, around Ikigai. I want to get to that, um, but I can't, uh, I can't not ask you about running. Um, okay. Running's a big piece of my world. I'm training for my first half Ironman right now. Um, you 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 shared a, a really good story on LinkedIn the other day um, about some of your progression over the last, I think, five or ten years of running. Um, again, running for me is <clears throat> it's another area where I can I can practice enjoying it, right? And it's it's another one of those beautifully counterintuitive moments where or or, or activities where people are like. I think most people would be like, okay, huffing and puffing in like 90 degree weather in the sun <laughs> after five, six, 10 miles. Like if you can find joy there, you're just crazy <laughs> or weird or something. Right. But you know, uh, uh, more and more, I, I actually need it. Like I, I go running and it, it, you know, I'm almost out of like an urgency to connect with myself in a different way, connect with nature. Um, what's been your experience with, with running and, and maybe even share a little bit about that story the other day. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Time. I crave it. And and I get that response too, from people they'll, they'll say, so, <laughs> so you run like on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and yeah. So uh, the story you're referring to was uh, uh, Facebook has this kind of cool feature. Facebook has its things, but one thing I do like about it is the memories feature and it just so happened that on this same day, I started running about 10, 11 years ago. Um, uh, I should say again, but seriously, 11 years ago. And and I had come home from work the, and uh, just had a rough day. Didn't want to run, didn't want to do anything. But I, I made myself go out and run. I ran two miles. That's all the further I was running at the time. Um, and uh, and it it charged me, right? It, it, it you know, I felt good. I felt some accomplishment. I had the physical benefits of it. And then I had read that like on that same day, a few years later with a similar day at work, uh, there's a theme developing here. <laughs> 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 and I went out and ran four miles and felt that same level of accomplishment. And then on that same day, a few years after that, my family was posting pictures they had taken of me as I crossed the finish line of my first half marathon. Mm. Right. And then um, on that same day, again, a, a year or so later, I was at 800 miles on my way to running a thousand miles for the year. And then um, probably even more importantly, like last year was by seeing that it triggered me to look at where was I on my, my mileage. And I found out that um, I had uh, I had COVID early in the year um, and just wiped me out. I mean, uh, you know, I, I literally thought I was going to die. I mean, it was just like, awful as everybody knows and months and months later i was still having a horrible time breathing and i had just you know i just committed to running i just did because like you said it for me it's it's my mental health is dependent on it almost and there were months when i just couldn't and so i i started running and it was terrible i mean i was doing terrible it was and i just kept embracing that it's like this is what you can do today do what you can do today and I had made all those gains. I mean, my my VO2 max, and if you're into running at all, all the metrics, right, were really top, top level, my fitness for my age and uh, all those things, right? And uh, I was back down to almost zero again, almost like my two mile mark. Mm. But I kept going and I kept going and, and I saw I had hit 600 miles, which is still f pretty far behind. But I was like, you know, I could do a thousand again. I might be able to do this. And I, I embraced that from that moment. But it was like looking back over all of that, I could see how far I'd come and the things that mattered and the things that had energized me. And uh, yeah, it was quite a it was quite a awakening for me to see all that. And and we so often, you know, you kind of miss what you've what you've done and how far you've come. And when you get a chance to see that, it's like, dude, I was happy with two miles, mm. and I was. And I, that's not even talking about the speed, right? That's right, just right. completed two miles. And now I've done marathons and, and uh, several years of thousand miles and, and so forth. And um, and yet not where I want to be yet. So, mm. No, it's a beautiful memory. And 
Uh, sounds like one of the one of the better features of Facebook. <laughs> yes, right, right. It's, it has its uh, it has its uh, critics and appropriately so. But that's one thing that I actually, if I could figure out how to maintain that same sort of thing, I probably would get off of. But I I love that because especially um, with kids and you know things like that, my my daughter got married on coincidentally the same day that we found out my son was engaged, but many years before it was like the same day. And we didn't really, none of us realized that it's like, Oh, but it came up on the memories page. It's like, Oh, that's cool. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah there's some, some interesting things to pull from this uh, coincidental dating here. It seems as well, um, as well as <clears throat> recognition of how far you've come, which we all have trouble with right like those two miles at that moment just were like the world to you and now you know you're seemingly more advanced right and running <clears throat> those two miles don't don't quite mean as much but it doesn't mean that they shouldn't <laughs> right right, right. Uh, yeah i i don't uh, i don't even consider it a run anymore if i don't you know do at least four or five i mean it's kind of like why well, get sweaty <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, beautiful. Well, I think we have to talk about Ica guy. I mean, you you mentioned it in so much of your com in, in so much of your comments um, or your commentary on LinkedIn. Um, I you know I looked it up and um, understand a little bit of it, but I, I assume you've been working on it for a long time. Um, I want to kind of get your um, just like your general perspective on Ica guy and maybe some of the stuff that you've, um, some of the latest stuff that's up to date on, on your thoughts of it. Sure. So, um, Ikigai, the word is, it's a Japanese combo word that literally def defined as life purpose. And your Ikigai is your purpose. It's, you know, you can kind of define it as your reason for getting up in the morning and where I go a little deeper than what you'll get off of like, uh, off of Wikipedia or other things like that is that, it's living into that purpose and that unique expression of you, your gifts, your passions, your skills, your, your chance to impact the world, putting all that together and living into that and spending that time doing only what you can uniquely do. That's what, what Ikigai is. And when you pull all of that together, that unique aspect of you, then you can become the best in the world at what you're called to do, which is being you. Mm. Uh, and your your ikigai and purpose, once it's clear, uh, it just becomes core to your essence. You know, your being, your doing. I call it like a guy, like a north star. And it's it's amazing when you when you have an understanding of that, the incredible things that start to fall in place for you. And you're not you naturally start to reframe your focus and your energy, and doors begin to open for you uh, to live that out in ways that you know maybe you've never considered before. Mm. Love it, love it. Uh, you, you being you, and you put, and you bring this into a lot of your corporate consulting work. H how often do you bump into like, um, you know, the the sort of work self versus the personal self? Because um, because I I'm all in on that, right? Like I I actually think you know if we can if we can nail the personal self, right? The work self sort of takes care of it. Um, but but that's not always I think the norm of how people view it. Right. So let me, I'll take a one quick step back and just kind of share with you my own uh, maybe career journey. And then I'll link that right to that if I can. Please. So going way back um, when I was 16 years old, I got into uh, to radio and TV uh, at a commercial radio station, not like a school thing, like, which is just insane. I mean, if you think of it, it's just, it's just insane. Um, and uh, I did that for a number of years and uh, I really loved it. And then uh, just to give you a sense for how crazy that world is, I joined the Marine Corps to have a more normal life. All right. <laughs> well, and what were you doing for this commercial radio station? Were you like DJing or what were you doing? Yeah, I was, I was a disc jockey. I did uh, television news for a while, although I, I do have a face for radio, as most people will admit. Um, <laughs> no. I, you I do that a great voice, though. I, I picked up on that right away. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. It's, uh, it was really interesting because I, I, I got into the business and then uh, the my, my mentor, the guy that hired me uh, a few years later, I mean, I, I could look back, not unlike the two mile thing. Right. And, and I knew I had no business in radio. And I, so I asked him, I said, you know what, 
why did you hire me? He goes, man, this 16 year old kid comes walking into a real live radio and TV station. It's kind of a big deal, right? And thinks he should have a job here. I just wanted to know what you were all about. <laughs> so he hired me. Now, and, that's a uh, true mentor, dude. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. What yeah, a crazy just, connection. Uh, what a crazy, yeah, 16, man. 16 is, that, that's young as an understatement. Yeah, to be yeah. in a situation. I, uh, I learned a lot, it, but it was a crazy world. I would not let my own children work in that environment at 16 years old. But mm. um, it was great, though. It really it did teach me how to speak. It did teach me um, how to present and how to, uh, especially in news, too, to, to pull things together quickly and concisely and tell a story. And uh, so it was an incredible building ground for me. But um, and. Uh, Fred, Fred Morris was, Fred Morris Peavy was his name. His air name was Fred Morris because Peavy sounded weird, I guess he said. Um, uh, sadly, he passed away just a couple of years ago, but uh, uh, I, I left that and I, I was- To go chill out, in the Mar- chill out that? at the Marine, and you left that to go chill out at the Marines. Chill out in the Marine Corps, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Said no one ever. And, yeah, yes, exactly. Um, and I was a I was a sergeant in the Marines. I mean, some people go in the Marines, they do a, a, a good job at things, but I mean, like to be a sergeant, you gotta be, you got to be into it. You got to, it's, it's a lot, right? Mm-hmm. That's a big deal, especially in, in four years. And then left that and got into um, engineering. I uh, was a radio frequency engineer working on MRIs. Uh, and the, the in- interesting thing there was I worked on radar and radar jamming in the Marine Corps. So electronic countermeasures. Uh, if you saw the movie Top Gun, and I think they're going to redo this, but uh where they're they're flying and the missiles are beeping it's beeping and missiles are locked on i worked on things that jammed that and said no no the aircraft isn't over here it's over there Mm. so that the missile would go off and um the interesting thing is that converts almost almost identically to magnetic resonance imaging so mris uses the same technology for uh intelligence gathering and so forth so uh, i got a job right away out of the out of the marine corps a small startup uh, company that was making MRIs. And um, we said they were hiring military people because they were used to long hours and low pay, but uh, it was it was because of our training. Uh, and so anyway, I progressed through that engineering and then um, we, uh, we started connecting the medical equipment together and somebody at GE said, you know, this internet thing may turn out to be something, we should probably start a team. <laughs> and so I got into that. Uh, worked in that for a number of years. Then I moved into uh, management and executive leadership at Fortune 500 companies and then continuous improvement uh, work. And, and I share all of that to say throughout that, I was living my ikigai. People will often link it right to a profession. And if, if you want to look at the, the weirdest, most incongruent professional path, I think I just laid it out for you, right? Radio disc jockey, sergeant in the Marine Corps, engineer, executive, right? And yet at each point, I can see those threads of the times that I was the most uh, effective, that I was the most focused, uh, the most jazzed and, and into it. All of those things involved uh, my guy, And that's where I encourage people to find that and then incorporate that into whatever you're doing. Mm. The, it's, it's purpose over profession. The profession itself, there's a lot of ways to bring that out, to manifest that. Um, and it doesn't like so many people get hung up. Oh, am I in the right kind of job or not? It's like, it's not really relevant. I mean, it might be relevant to you know some degrees, money, that kind of thing. But in terms of relevant to following your purpose, it almost doesn't matter. And that's really freeing to me to think, oh, if I don't have to worry about what it is. It's more about me and understanding the unique aspect of, of really being me. And it's our one true universal calling to be ourselves, right? What we were made to be. Mm. No, I love that. I love that. And, and I absolutely agree. I've, I've actually had conversations with with friends around um, this idea of, I, 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 another way I say um, describing living with intention is enjoying the pursuit of purpose. And you're right. Anytime I say that to someone, they're like, well, what if I haven't found purpose yet? What if my job's not my current purpose? And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Who said anything about defining purpose? <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not here to define purpose. Purpose might be this crazy thing that I have no idea. I might not even nudge, nudge, uh, nudge up against what my purpose is until I'm you know, old and gray. I hope it's that great. 
you know, I hope it's that grand that, 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 um, you know, I, I don't find it until I'm ready. Um, let alone tying it to a specific job. Now, have you always felt that way? Like, I, I agree. You, this is really cool, um, you know, background and, and going from DJ to Marine Corps to, um, you know, engineer to executive leader. Like, this is, that's that's great. Do, can you pinpoint, like, a time where um, either you didn't feel that way or something came into your world to, to, to start a, help you realize that you were on, on, on track and living your Ica guy? Sure. So, um, uh, what I would say is, uh, I wasn't really aware of the, of the term Ikigai until probably about five or six years ago. Um, but the, I started a, a path of self-reflection, I'm going to say a little over two decades ago mm. that, uh, that point in life, um, had had a number of, of, personal challenges. Uh, my, my son had some serious health issues. Uh, we almost lost him and, and my wife started developing some things and it just caused me to reflect. And my, my career was doing well, but there were just a number of things that just caused me to pause. And so at that point, I can say that that's, that's really when I looked at not the transition from disc jockey to, to Marine or that kind of thing. I was too dumb and young, young and dumb at the time to, to see it. Uh, and in fact, um, it really was in retrospect that I, I've looked back on that time in the radio, for example, um, as really a building block for being able to live out my ikigai, right? The, the skills development and the confidence and other things that came from that are really contributors to my ikigai. And I, I would never have, maybe it would have been challenging to get that at the same point in my life without radio and, and TV and as part of my background. And the Marine Corps is the same thing. Those were all building blocks. They helped me live it out as opposed to it. Um, but it was the, um, I'm gonna say uh, a few years ago, about six, like six years ago or seven, I could see that my career was probably not gonna end the way I thought it would, right? I thought I would, you know, right off into the sunset, I had done some really great work for the company I was working for, had, uh, literally transformed a 160 year old company uh, through continuous improvement and thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to 65 and then and I'll officially retire and all those things. And I could see that things were changing and that just wasn't going to happen. Mm. Um, I had been at GE for long enough to know how companies work and this company was starting to act a lot like that. And so uh, I thought I better get on LinkedIn, you know, I better start because the last time, the last thing you want to do is get on LinkedIn when you need a job, right? <laughs> so well and I just started writing. I just started writing what I was thinking about. There was no, you know, plan or, you know, develop image development or message thing. It was just really what I was thinking about and, and things I thought was were valid to share and and started sharing it. And I did that for a while. And since that was really just me, wasn't anything work representing work or anything like that. I started asking some friends and, and uh, people that, that were close to me that say, if you're going to label that brand, what's my brand? What, am, you know, what are you seeing? And one guy said, uh, well, I don't know about brand, but you ought to check into Ikigai. Mm. And I said, what's Ikigai? Said, oh, you know, was just, just check it out. <laughs> and so I dug into it and that's when it really hit me, uh, Bobby, that, that, that it was like, oh, this is what I've been doing. When I was at my happiest, when I was at my best, it was when I was helping people uncover their best, right? The, from, I, and I, I'll throw in one more unique thing. So I coached my daughter's eighth grade basketball team uh, to, a nation, to eighth grade national championships, finished sixth in the, the country. And, wow. And I can tell you moments that I was coaching that team, moments I was coaching my own team, moments I was pr producing pr uh, new products, all of them had that same element of helping people uncover their purpose and live into it and do the best that they could do. Um, and so I finally put a name to all the stuff I'd been doing that I really dug, right? Uh, and then what I've done since then is really try to build a structure around it to help others you know, come into that as well. Hmm. So you find this this term and this sort of framework, and it, it it actually gives you this awareness of what you had already experienced. 
Um, exactly. It was like, ah, oh, that's what I've been looking for. I didn't even know I was looking for that. Right. And then, uh, then serendipity kind of comes along, right? So, um, uh, two years ago, uh, my uh, department was eliminated at work and um, the exec VP came to me and he said, well, we can, we've got this other job for you or you could take uh, the age you're at and where you're at, you could take early retirement and the, uh, like a package and things. And um, because I had a real sense for my Ikigai, I could look at that job. So we will go to job on the, in this case, I could look at that job and see there was virtually no time I would be spending where I was really in my, my best space, you know, mm. where, living my Ikigai. It wasn't a bad job. It wasn't, you know, terrible. And it, again, it's, it's a great company. But that role would not have been it. And because I understood where my fulfillment comes from and my purpose, I was able to say no to that. And in fact, um, we had the conversation. He was convinced I was going to take it because um, I probably need the financial security and all that. And um, I, I sat down with him and I said, well, you know, as my grandmother used to say, I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. I'm going to take your generous offer and leave and start my consulting company that I'd wanted to do anyway. <laughs> so, mm. <laughs> but I, that empowered me to do that. I mean, the, the obvious decision was to keep the financial security and, and ride it to retirement. And I have every day since then, I am so glad. I mean, I, I will say during the, 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 the worst months of the pandemic last year, I thought, you know, that financial security would have been really nice when all my consulting work dried up and a lot of my coaching clients went away and things like that. But uh, I could just see the, from it, and I'll say integrity from, from, a, from being integrated, myself, my worth, my essence as a human, would, I would have been damaging my integrity. I would have been disintegrating myself doing that because I'd have been investing so much of my time and energy in something that was draining as opposed to building. And so uh, even though, again, there's maybe some things I would have enjoyed or liked uh, like a, like a fuller bank account. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, I would never trade the last two years, you know, for those, for working in that role. And I'm so grateful that I had that sense of my Ikigai to be able to guide me and help me at that decision point. Yeah, I mean, we, we don't get to uh, live, live life without obstacle. We don't get to live life, um, you know, completely on our terms. Like, oh, there are other things, there are other powers at play, right? And when we're, when we're living a life of purpose, when we're living a life of intention, it's, 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 you know, we don't fool ourselves, right? We don't want to fool anybody and say that that's just this, this like, you know, rainbow and unicorn utopia, <laughs> right? No, it's, it's actually that exact situation where you were presented with in a sort of an abrupt challenge, right? Um, and, and a lot of people would have taken that job, right? Would have taken that security. But what what you did have with you is is that awareness and that confidence to be able to say you know what that that actually doesn't feel right it, it even might you know intellectually sound right it actually might you might be able to reason that it's the better move but it sounds like you didn't you didn't think it felt like the right move right and and it would have closed so many doors that have opened since then too i mean uh uh being able to be a, a greater part of, as you mentioned earlier, I'm a granddad and that's probably one of the things I enjoy most in the world. And I have total freedom over my schedule, which allows me to spend a couple days a week with them and uh, would not trade that, wouldn't trade the ability to be completely present with them. So I'm not fighting traffic. I'm not worried about what, you know, strategic this or that's going on that I need to work on tomorrow or anything like that. I'm all in with them. And, uh, but also it's really freed me up to, to share and explore and, and develop. I never would have thought even, even two years ago that I would be the Ikigai guy, right? I thought that was an aspect and certainly something for me, but that is now the thing I want to share as much or more, uh, as anything. And, you know, you asked earlier about companies helping helping a company understand what its purpose is, right? 
and then aligning that and and getting the co- the company itself to work with its people to find out what theirs is and then merging them together right if if you're working in your your purpose space and that's supporting the purpose of the company i mean everybody is winning in that case the the customers the the business the people uh the employees everybody is winning in that space the families at home that have a uh, a more present uh, parent or, or whomever coming home. I mean, it's a win-win, right? So for me, pulling that together, and that's the reason uh, I, I named my company Vluru was uh, not, there's not one particular kind of like lean people are very into lean or Six Sigma people be into Six Sigma. I'm into whatever works for you, right? And so helping put that together helps the company win, the people win, they're developing themselves, they're developing their skills, they're taking that home with them. I mean, it's just all of that comes together to meet that purpose-driven uh, kind of approach to life in general, but business too. Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting, when you get into the business world, we, we talked about this a little bit, right? The personal self versus the professional self. I think in consulting work, it can be, okay, the, the tactical, you know, strategies and like, you know, you, you talked about, uh, and I, I just know you have a ton of experience in like continuous improvement, um, you know, innovation techniques, right? Like, um, for me, it's like, it's like, okay, how can we improve, you know, the sales strategy, the pricing strategy, the scripts, et cetera. And at the same time, like if I'm being honest, when I go in, like I'm more interested in developing the personnel, figuring out how to line people with purpose so that they're showing up with intention, they're showing up with gratitude, they're showing up, you know, ready to solve problems, collaborate, do good, et cetera. How, how do you see that sort of balancing act play out in, in some of the companies you work with and some of the individuals you work with? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question because it's not either or it is both yeah. right? and and um, I know we'd all love to just work on what we want to work on and kumbaya all day and all that right I mean that's kind of <laughs> what people think of um, but uh, you know a company still has to make has to make a, uh, a profit they also have to make a product that serves other people and it has to work and it has to work well and they have to have services that support it and all those things, right? So there's a reality to that that I think supports both, you know, the, the idea of purpose in your in your personal life as well as your, your business life. Um, if, you, uh, if you, again, Google Ikigai, you'll find a four circle Venn bin, bin diagram and it talks a lot about um, your passions, what are your passions? What are you good at? What's the world need? And what are they willing to pay for? Mm. And I'll, I'll share with you that I, I like that, although it's not, it is not Ikigai, it's a nice diagnostic tool. And so to your point, let's say we, let's say we have a company that has its, has its passion and purpose just down, right? And we know that people need our products or our services and they'd be willing to pay for them. But let's say we don't have the skill Maybe we don't have the skill to deliver that on time or with a quality level that they need. That gives us an opportunity to kind of examine, well, what do we need to do to, to reach that? How can we get that, right? And um, that can involve things like, you know, Lean and Six Sigma or other improvement things. Um, we'll talk about running. I mean, running is part of my life fulfillment. It's not a business thing. There were some skills I had to develop and some things, some improvements and some things that I had to do. I had to embrace uh, starting small. I mean, I know your your slogan, right? I love I love that. That is like one of my favorite, favorite things uh, that you do and that, that, you know, don't wait, start smaller as you go. I mean, that's just so powerful. And incorporating that into your personal development, into your career development, into the, the way your company works, all of that comes together. So. So it's not as disintegrated, if you will, as as we might think. Mm. Um, it's when you start with the when you start with the improvement stuff first before you understand why, then you can get off. I always tell people they'll talk about lean and they'll say, "Well, you know, I got to get more efficient." And when I was running uh, uh, the program at my last company, I had a call center uh, director come to me and she said, "Oh, I, I want to work with you. I want you want to be one of your early pilots." I need to um, I need to get my team more efficient. I said, really? 
how do you know that's your problem? She goes, oh, well, we got, we've got to get off the phone quickly. We need to get our average handle time or the time we're on the phone lower. So really, again, how do you know that? Well, because we got to get more efficient. Okay, okay, I got you. And uh, if you've ever come to my office, you would see uh, I have a red rotary phone on my desk. Um, and it's, it's just a perfect symbol for improvement. But I used it in this case. I, I, I said, well, I'll just write up a procedure for you right now. They'll take care of you right now. She said, that's awesome. I said, so, so I grabbed my phone, I pick it up and I said, I'll teach your operators to pick up the phone and hang up immediately. Um, have I solved your problem? Mm. She's like, well, no. I said, no, actually I haven't, I haven't hit max efficiency yet because there's still like a second or two, but after a while they'll, your customers will quit calling and we'll have max efficiency. Again, have I solved your problem? And she, she said something colorful. I won't say uh, on your your podcast here, but uh, it wasn't. Yeah, yeah how did she? Uh, yeah, how did she take that nice little metaphor did, there? <laughs> she did not. She did not find my demonstration to be as amusing as I did. But um, but the point was what I what I said to her was we had a we had a thing we called the rule of three, and it was it was widely known even in like our field offices and stuff to call the home office three times and take the best answer you got. And each time they were calling and the average channel time at, at that time was five minutes. Mm. I said, so, so let's just say we've got 15 minutes of total contact time because they're calling three times. What if instead of that, we actually answered their problem or answered their question, but it took us 10 minutes. What have we done? Well, yeah, we've doubled average handle time, but we've cut total contact time and improved our quality, improved the customer experience and all the things. She's like, oh yeah. I said, so if you lead with efficiency, you get things like getting off the phone quickly and hanging up. Right. If you lead with understanding what you need to fix. So it, again, in lean terms, it's, it's waste removal and value add. So where can you re- eliminate the waste in the process and where can you increase the value add? If you lead with that, you'll get the efficiency. And so it's much like that when you think about, you know, can we, can we make things efficient? Can we do, can we improve things at work? It's like, let's take a step back. And what do we need to do from a purpose standpoint first? And then let's use all those wonderful tools that help us get better at our jobs and other things or improve ourselves or any of that. Um, that's when you get the power and the value of them because you're starting with the right thing. Mm. I, 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 you just struck a chord with me because in, in when I'm consulting, I call this consulting crack where <laughs> so, somebody comes with you just seething with a problem. Like they're like, man, I'm just desperate for a solution. And, and I know I got a little something. I got a little something that I can slide on over that'll sort of like create that quick fix of like, all right, you want efficiency? Well, if I give you this little thing, you'll, you'll get efficient. But I don't <laughs> think it's the real solution. But I know if I give you a demonstration like David just did, you're just going to kick me out of your office. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I give you the consulting crack and uh, I, I know that it's just a bridge to nowhere. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it, it's tough sometimes because you do have to, you have to meet them where they are. Yeah, yeah. You have to help. And that, that goes in anything. I mean, just conversations with, with people on running. I mean, I've, I've talked with people about running and uh, to help them, Get it, you, you know, there's things I'd love to tell them right at the beginning. I'm not going to do it because I know they're not they're not ready for that, right? Like like you said, the the pain, the endurance, and all of the things that, at that you know 13 mile and 18 mile mark. Eh, maybe we won't talk about that till after they can run more than a mile. We'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. Let's not romanticize about you mile right. 18 yet. Yeah, it's, it's the same. I think it's the same in consulting. But I love that consulting crack. I like that, I like that because. Yeah. And, and, you know, true in anything, anytime you're trying to pass something on, just, just meeting people where they are. Um, if I can give you another, uh, it's his business example, but it was the same, same company. We were, we were, I had led uh, aspects of it at GE and I, I led it at uh, another Fortune 500 company and another one. And uh, I knew that this company would be different because every company, just like every person is, is a little different. And I wanted to test and see what worked there. So I did some pilots and we worked as this one small team in operations. And I think they did like insurance applications, but it's not really important what it was, but I went to them and I said, you know, I introduced myself and stuff like that. And they said, look, look, Dave, you seem like a nice guy, um, but we are doing everything that can be done. We're working as hard as we can. <laughs> Everything we're doing is as good as it can be done. You're just wasting your time. 
And I said, oh, okay, uh, uh, why don't you humor me, right? Let's, let's just talk about what you do. Let's just map it out and, and talk about it. So I pointed this one woman, I said, why don't you talk about what you do in this particular part of the process? And she said, well, I make three copies of the form. I fax one, I shred two, and when the fax is confirmed, I shred the original. I said, you do what? She said, I make three copies of the form. I fax one, I shred two, and when the fax is confirmed, I shred the original. I said, say that again slower. She gets about halfway through the third time. She's like, why am I making three copies? I, I don't know. I mean, you guys are the ones doing whatever can be done, right? And we dug into it a little bit and they used to have to make three copies and, and this was for life insurance. So it's, uh, you know, privacy and stuff. You have to shred, shred documents and things, but it opened their eyes to at least being, you know, maybe we should take a look at this. And once we dug in, there was a lot more stuff like that. Not, none of them nearly as fun as that, but, but a lot more stuff like that. And, um, that that gave them the impetus to look and try. And we ended up really doing some cool things in their team to improve their everyday work. And then other teams saw that and they're like, hey, uh, we do a lot of the same kind of things. Could you work with us? And before long, I'm, I can't keep up with the demands of people pulling me, wanting me to help them. And I had to build a team and, mm -hmm. and grow it beyond that. But it was just being willing to meet them where they were and just have them talk through it. You know, just tell me what you're doing. Talk to me. Um, I'm glad they thought I was a nice guy. I don't know what they would have done. Yeah. If he was a nice guy. But. <laughs> no, that's that's beautiful. I mean, uh, it's 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 challenging sometimes uh, to to meet people halfway, particularly people that are that that say things like "we're doing everything perfect," essentially. Um, mm -hmm. As a person myself, who uh, you know, I go through every day thinking I'm. I'm I'm not even close to perfect. I'm 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 literally just a living, breathing, continuous improvement machine. So, <laughs> you know, if I think that way and I run into somebody who thinks they're perfect, I'm like, does not compute. I know. <laughs> We're gonna have to have a conversation, and hopefully, I can still be a nice guy. Yeah. Um, well, you know, that goes to to <laughs> what you were talking about earlier with the the idea that I had a sense for what I what my mission was. Right, I had a sense. And I didn't, because I had that strong sense that I wasn't pressured to deliver immediate metrics or, you know, go in and tell his team, well, tough, this is what we're going to do. And we're going to do it today. I mean, I could have done that. And I probably would have had some backing from the executives because they wanted to see some of those results. But because I had that sense of, of purpose and mission, I was able to be more patient with them and to, to work with them, to bring them along. Because m what I wanted to accomplish was different than just metrics, right? Mm -hmm. And that's that's where again having that sense of your ikigai having that sense of your purpose and how you might live it out is so important and changes behavior because yeah most businesses like look dude i got to get three of these projects done in two months and i got to get a million dollars worth of value out of it and i don't care if you don't like it or not right and that wasn't my approach in simply because i was coming i had a different mission yeah. Yes, I had to get the million dollars. I mean, no doubt. At some at some point, I still had to deliver those. Uh, I just had more patience about it because I was focused on my actual mission, which was helping helping them see it. That's right. Yeah, patience evokes patience. You know, you you. It's it's so simple and so logical. Sometimes you know, if if you lead with good intentions, good intentions will will follow. Um, man, this is great. I could talk to you forever. I want to squeeze in um, a little bit about this concept, modern elder. Um, you know, it's so fitting for, for, for our conversation. Um, you know, all of this wisdom and experience that you're, that you clearly have. I mean, you just, again, I, I could listen to you forever because I'm just picking up bits and pieces here um, that I can take into my own life. And with the, just seemingly new startups, you know, popping up by the by the minute, um, connecting those new young minds, young companies, with folks that have that experience and you know what I, what I'll call wisdom, um, and, and combining the two is what what could potentially produce such remarkable results in in, in much shorter time spans. That's kind of how I see see modern elder. But again, I've only picked up on it a couple of times. I think you actually something you wrote uh, introduced me to the concept. Um, 
what what does it mean to you and and how long have you been sort of exploring the subject yeah so so chip Conley actually wrote uh, a book with the concept of modern elder he was um he was a guy that had been in the hotel business for a long time and i think the two guys that founded airbnb hired him uh to bring that kind of wisdom and, and insight and so he just was living that concept but uh where it, what triggered it for me and what what i saw as an opportunity was uh, a number of years ago uh, i i was interviewed for a job where it was a startup company and um the, the founder was sharing with me that you know, we're hitting, we're hitting all our metrics. This is just during our conversation, the interview, we're hitting all our metrics and yet none of our customers are happy. They're not, they're not satisfied. And all I goes, what would you, what would that make you think? And I said, well, I think maybe you're not measuring the right things. He goes, yes, that's it. Exactly. Right. And he pounds on the table and he goes, none of my people think that way. They think about cool new features. And he had all these really cool and, and very, very neat people. I got to meet a lot of them um, who were, focused on engineering and app development and all that kind of thing. And they, they weren't thinking that way. And he said, he said, I'm looking for an adult in room to have the adult in the room, right. To help us. And, and I think that's maybe a little pejorative. That's why I like the modern elder thing, but it's, as you said, it's somebody who's, who's been there, who's done that. Not, not to suggest that you would be, uh, well, this is the way we've always done it because God, if, you want to give me the fingernails on chalkboard say that's the way we've always done it to me right i personally i hate that right and um and that would be the last thing you'd want in a modern elder what you would want is someone that has had that experience who asks the questions who says well you know why are why are we using these metrics and what would tell us how to understand what the customer experience is and and things like that leading people through that level of, of engagement and interaction and and being a force multiplier, right, of what they're doing. So, so many great things that, that all of those people were doing for that company, and yet they weren't hitting their, their results because they were missing something. How can you take all the great talent they have and multiply it by adding that, that little bit of value that needs to be done that's gonna make it really worthwhile? Um, and unfortunately, it didn't, uh, it didn't work out. The guy, uh, uh, through the process of interviewing me, he ended up selling the company. I have no idea what happened to it, but, um, but it really triggered for me this idea of doing that. And I will say my last several years of, um, of my time in corporate, I kind of tried to fill that role uh, where I was being that mentor, being that person who could ask and could help. Uh, while I was doing my other duties too, I, I would, I'd spend a lot of my lunches with, with other, especially young people, uh, but uh, anyone that was interested in just, you know, understanding maybe what they ought to do instead or how they might approach things or what they might consider and imparting that wisdom because I felt like I had, I'd done, I had been really granted a, a wonderful experience at that company and I was just trying to pass that on to, you know, some other people as well. And, and it's been my experience in my own, my own life, especially uh, like the Marine Corps structure is really built almost in that modern elder uh, sort of model, the, the senior, the senior people, the senior enlisted people. Um, my own uh, commanding officer, uh, who was just instrumental in helping me learn leadership and understand. He was like that. He would just, he wasn't like a, he was a hard charger. I mean, he was like a Vietnam vet and all that. And yet, he would just ask questions. Mm. He just constantly asked questions. I know every time I'd come into his office, he'd ask these questions. Pretty soon, even a knucklehead you know, junior Marine could figure out maybe I should be asking those questions every time before I come into his office and have those answers, mm. you know, and teaching you to think and teaching you to, to uh, approach problems in that way. You know, yeah, no, it's, I mean, you said a lot of fascinating things about the modern elder and peace, modern elder piece. I think um, two things in particular, one, we, we, I think as society, we sort of, put this stigma on experience as having um, having to do with being stuck in a way, right? Stuck in a certain lane. And that's just not necessarily the case, right? Um, and you have to, as a modern elder, as an effective modern elder, you have to, you know, both things have to be true. You have to be experienced and you have to be iterative and you have to be, um, you know, skilled and practiced in the latest, you know, innovations, techniques, strategies, 
you know, questioning, et cetera. Um, and then on the flip side, as society, we sort of give the exact opposite stigma to youth into younger companies, right? Like, oh, of course they're progressive. Of course they're like trying new things. Of course they're innovative. And I've walked into plenty of startups, particularly engineering led startups. Dare I say, literally iterative focused companies, companies that are focused on iteration almost slowly, that like solely, that's their competitive advantage. And yet they're stuck in a very certain way yeah. of iteration. And you're just like, wow. This is this is really fascinating. Um, and you can get to a point like what you've suggested where you actually think you're doing everything right. And in some ways you are, you're just doing the wrong thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> or you're after the wrong thing by, by chance. So that's really, uh, yeah, that's really fascinating. Yeah, I, th I think the key thing to bring all that together and the value that, that you laid out is is having a level of humility, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and I do think, at least in my own life, uh, that's come from, maybe age or maybe it's maybe it's having white hair i don't know one of those two things place but yeah. um hey at least you got yeah. it baby it looks great yeah, yeah that's true that's true i'm glad i don't care what color it is as long as i got some on there um but having that, that humility to know you're not always right and, and examine it and really passing that on too i mean so yeah this is the way we, we've always done it well maybe that's not the right way to do it um and being open to that that's an element of of the modern el elder that i think uh, multiplies again the value of the experience the other because you can draw on it when you need to ignore it and do something new when you need to and so forth and and, and realize that you're not the end all be all let's work together beautifully said david well thank you for coming on the show um i know we'll connect more and more um like i said i could listen to you all day but I want to let you get back to your work. I've heard your trees falling a little bit in the background, so you go tend to those bad boys. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, for for whatever reason, uh, during the pandemic, all of my I think I don't think we have any trees left. Every tree in the neighborhood has been. It seems like every day, and and when I get on podcasts, it seems like they decide now would be a good time to uh, saw down a tree and grind it up into wood chips. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. I, I appreciate your patience with that. I love my neighbors. They're awesome people. They are. Their, their tree cutting is, is another matter, though. Beautiful, beautiful. Oh, before we go, how does everybody um, get, get in touch with David Marlowe? How do we uh, how, how do we connect with you? Um, where yeah. can people find you? Yeah, absolutely. The easiest way is is LinkedIn. That's where I'm most active, and uh, it's David E. Marlowe because uh, I think there's some other David Marlowes on there, but or the Ikigai guy, um, and you can reach me through there. Uh, you can also email me at uh, vluru1 at gmail.com. And any of those, I, I check all that every day and I'd love to hear from people. Beautiful. Well, thanks again for taking the time, David. You enjoy the day. Hey, it's Bobby. Thanks for listening to today's show. For more, follow Student of Intention at www.studentofintention.com. And remember, don't wait, start small, learn as you go.